Welcome to The Classical Mind, a podcast about the great books in the Western canon. We're your hosts. I'm Father Wesley Walker. And I'm Dr. Junius Johnson. Dr. Junius, how are you doing? I am good. Tired, but good. Yes, it's fall, so I imagine your class load in terms of teaching is pretty heavy right now. Yeah, but things are in full swing, pretty busy. I'm doing a lot of translating these days, and so I'm definitely filling the hours. Excellent, excellent. What are you translating? Um, lately, I've just finished translating a bit of Smaragdus, who was a 9th century bishop in, uh, under the Carolingian Empire. He wrote what's probably the earliest mirror of princes called the Royal Way for Louis the Pious. And so um, translating his thoughts about how a king should be. Excellent. That's really cool. Well, we are, uh, it feels like fall, so that's good. And I have started teaching as well. I teach Latin and logic, but also subbing at my son's school. So uh, yeah, things staying pretty busy. Also doing some translating, view of St. Victor's Marian theology. So nice. keeps keeps us busy, keeps us off the streets. That's right. <laughs> Excellent. Well, today I'm very excited. We have done in the past, before you were on the show, we did one platonic dialogue and it was the Apology. Uh, which is excellent, but I'm very excited because I think this is the first dialogue I've ever read. I ever read mm -hmm. of Plato's, which is the Euthyphro dilemma. So, uh, when when do you can you even remember the first time you read it? I think it must have been before. It must have been in college as well. So, which means it, it probably also well, and it wasn't the first. The Republic was the first dialogue I read, which was painful. But um, mm -hmm. I think it must have been the first non-Republic dialogue that I read because it was pretty early in my philosophical studies. It kind of felt like it was almost the first thing. Mm. Yeah, it is sort of a... I, I think I remember taking an intro to philosophy course and it being something that we, we had to read and discuss. Um, so it is, it is very important in terms of philosophy and theology. And I, I should probably put a disclaimer here at the beginning, which is that this will... This will perhaps be the most overtly theological episode that we've ever done. This is not primarily a theology podcast, though you and I both have do engage on a daily basis with theology. Um, and I think all of our listeners know that we come from an explicitly Christian perspective, even if we don't try and ram that down people's throats, and even if we invite conversation from people who maybe aren't um, uh, explicitly Christian. But... Um, yeah. So anyways, the point being, this will get theological. We will be assuming uh, that, you know, a, a Christian perspective, I think, as we engage some of these questions. But, um, you know, just if you don't, you can still engage with us. And and I think that's actually really makes our engagement even better. But that's where we're coming from. And so it will be more theological than normal today. Strap in. Yeah, strap in. That's right. <laughs> Trigger warning uh, at the beginning. So perhaps we could talk about the sort of story of the of the dialogue. There is uh, kind of a, 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 a not a con well a little bit of a conflict that's occurring. So Plato or Socrates meets Euthyphro, and what is he? What is Euthyphro's deal? What is he off to do? Yeah, Euthyphro is going to court to to bring his dad up on charges of murder. Um, and what happened was uh, his father had. Uh, caught a, a, a slave and, and and wrongdoing and so he kind of threw the slave into a ditch uh without any food or water while he went off to figure to find out what was to be done with him and the slave died while he was in the ditch and so um so euthyphro was is bringing his father up on charges of murder and euthyphro's family feel like he's um being ridiculous uh that he shouldn't be doing this um, but Euthyphro is is very, he's almost got sort of his martyr face on about how, you know, well, well, I know I have a duty to my father, you know, before the gods and whatnot, like justice is more important. And so I've got to do the right thing and, and bring my father up. And he has the distinct misfortune of running into Socrates on his way in for his court case, who's going to really probe him about all aspects of this. Euthyphro is described as being a younger man, right? Yeah. Yeah. He kind of, you kind of get that feel. I mean, he reminds me of sort of kind of cage stage. You know, he's very excited. Mm -hmm. uh, he definitely thinks he's right. And he's not so sure about the rest of us. Yeah. So the justification that Euthyphro gives for his actions is that, that these are the, this is the pious thing to do. Mm -hmm. And Socrates pushes him a little. <laughs> 
asking him to explain how he knows that it's pious. Right. And Euthyphro appeals to the to the gods. And he says that murder is something they don't like. In fact, actually, there's some overlap with our Oedipus conversation. Mm. The idea of murder is pollution. Right. And so because the gods see murder as pollution, they don't they don't like it. And so he's doing the right thing by trying to punish a murderer. Right. There's also good overlap in um, I mean, it has to you have to think about these. He's under competing claims because it's he almost sees himself in the position of Orestes, where on the one hand he's held by piety not to bring his father to judgment, and on the other hand he's held by piety or justice um, to bring his father to judgment. And uh, unlike Orestes, who really struggles with this, um, you don't get the feeling Euthyphro has struggled that much with it. He seems pretty clear about which one this is, which is his duty to the gods hate murder more than they hate um, a man who does not show due respect to his father. And so it's that's the bigger deal, and that's the one he's going to deal with. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There doesn't seem to be very much internal struggle with Euthyphro's decision, at least not at this point. He's pretty, yeah, he's he's pretty, pretty certain. Clear, yeah. <laughs> Which we were talking a little before, because throughout the dialogue, it does seem like Socrates is critical of Euthyphro. My read of the dialogue, and you might want to push back on this, is that maybe what Socrates is pushing back on is Euthyphro's underlying justification and attitude of certainty, more so than the actual action itself. Yeah, and and, and I, I think I do want to push back. I think that Socrates is, well, I don't know, I, I can't go so far as to say that Socrates believes that Euthyphro is wrong, but he's he's highly critical of Euthyphro, mm -hmm. uh, of, this, of this action. He definitely seems to think that it would require extraordinary circumstances to prosecute your own father. And, and I get the impression from the way he treats Euthyphro that he does not think Euthyphro has met those circumstances. So it might be good. You were talking a bit about um, reasons from the Gorgias why Socrates might be on Euthyphro's side here. It might be good for you to lay those out for us. Yeah. So in Gorgias, the 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 main thrust of the uh, that Socrates offers for the the purpose of rhetoric has to do with justice mm -hmm. and. Socrates says that if you commit a wrong, you should go before the judge and use rhetoric to explain to him what you did and basically ask for punishment because that punishment is good for your, your soul. Mm -hmm. That he even talks about a sort of final judgment in that dialogue, and you know, a soul that is um that gets away with doing wrong arrives at that final judgment looking inhuman, like an mm -hmm. inhuman soul. Mm -hmm. And so so he so he says you should be punished now so that you can you can be more human effectively. And he says if you love someone and they do wrong, first you use rhetoric to convince them that they did wrong. But even if they don't listen to you, then you go to the judge and you say this is what they did. And you ask the judge to punish them for their own good. The only time Socrates says not to use rhetoric in this context is if it's somebody you hate because it's better to let them just continue on doing the wrong thing and it's actually <laughs> worse for their soul. Um, nice. So at the end, you get the last laugh, I guess. <laughs> I did a paper a long time ago. I presented a paper at a conference once about um, about the purpose of rhetoric in Socrates and the purpose of rhetoric in the Minor Prophets. Mm. And it's a very similar, you know, the prophets are people who are who lived in their community and people hated them because... I mean, they treated them like Euthyphro's family treats Euthyphro because yeah. they were the ones being critical of the family or of their communities. And, you know, when someone from the inside is critical, that often is more intolerable to people than if it's someone from the outside. I mean, you see this in political rhetoric. You know, if somebody stands up to their side because they think their party is doing something wrong, they get castigated and sort of thrust out into the outer darkness more than somebody from the other side who's critical of them. They expect that from them, but they don't expect it from someone close to them. Yeah. So for that reason, I think that Socrates may be 
okay with the idea of what Euthyphro is doing, though perhaps we could say that the bar should still be pretty high. I mean, you should still mm -hmm. be pretty certain. Yeah, so that that's a really great argument, and that's and that's a wonderful uh, bit of text to bring into the conversation. Thank you for laying that out for us, and and I, it's so relevant. So that that's a, that's really really good. Said contra. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, I I would lean on Euthyphro's presentation of what happened and how the family, what his family's precise concern is. Their precise concern is, we don't think this was murder. Like, right. The father bound the slave and threw him into the pit so that he could send to the oracle to find out what was to be done with him. And then through neglect, the slave died before the messengers came back from the oracle. Um, their argument is this is more like manslaughter than murder. And that being the case, they might respond to the Gorgias Socrates that this doesn't actually come under that heading. Uh, maybe something ought to be done. Maybe some punishment ought to be made for this involuntary death. But his, his intention was not to murder the slave, but actually just to bind him over for punishment. Um, and I think in there's in that ambiguity, the fact that Euthyphro does not consider that an argument that should give him pause, I think that's what brings him in for Socrates is really biting attention here. Sure, sure. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. And I think it also makes it ironic that in the Apology, which is, I think, the dialogue after nice this, way, yeah. that he is being charged with corrupting the youth when here he's <laughs> he's actually trying to pull one of them back from making a mistake. That's right. Uh, but this is one of the things that, you know, the Euthyphro gets read, as, as, as Father Wesley indicated, as, you know, this sort of philosophical dilemma. Um, a lot of people read this, and this is something we want to come back around to, a lot of people read this as um, sort of disproving the possibility of a Christian account of things, because it proves that you couldn't have a proper relationship of God and the good and whatnot. Um, but in context of the Platonic Dialogues, this is a prologue to the Apology. Socrates is outside the courthouse about to go in. And as he says multiple times to Euthyphro, if you could teach me what piety is, that would really help me in my case, because that's what I'm being charged with impiety, right? Um, so I, I really, it's really personally urgent for me to learn this lesson from you. And I think part of what's at stake in Plato setting this conversation when he does, um, right before the apology and, and now not letting us forget that we're about to go into the apology is um, he's teaching us, he's trying to tell us something about Socrates' relationship to the youth on the one hand, as you're describing, and also his relationship to the gods on the other hand. This is, uh, I feel like Plato was saying, this is a necessary context on Socrates to bring into the apology, or you won't get why he does what he does and why he says what he says. Sure, sure. And I, I actually think the Gorgias is the other major context for that, because He's he's in that spot that you're describing where he's brought before the judge and he's got to if if there's anything wrong with him, he's got to accuse himself of that if he's going to follow his own philosophy. Um, yeah, I'm not going to get I keep wanting to get distracted and talk about the apology, but we've done you've done that already. So I'm going to. Yes, yes, hold yes. we did cover that way back when. Um, yeah, it is very interesting. Um, so in the dialogue, Euthyphro's position initially is that he, what he's doing is pious because what is pious is near to the gods and this creates a a, a problem and 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 it ends up setting up a, a dilemma which is how, how do what is the relationship between the gods and piety mm -hmm. in other words do the gods sort of arbitrarily decide what's pious or does piety exist outside of the gods somehow Right. And and neither answer is really good. You know, if, if you have to if you're stuck on one horn of the dilemma, you're in the you end up being kind of uh, stuck um, and, and not able to explain it properly account to for the relationship between the gods and the good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you first point is I don't I don't get it. Right. Like the, I'm bringing my father to judgment because he's wrong. But everyone acknowledges that Zeus essentially did the same thing to Kronos. He brought Kronos to judgment for the way he was behaving. And so um, they contradict themselves in condemning me for doing what they praise Zeus for doing. Like this is exactly the wrong argument to bring to Socrates because Socrates is like, yeah, those are the kinds of stories about the gods that I have trouble believing in, which are part of the reason why I've got the next case after you. That's right. <laughs> 
I think maybe Zeus shouldn't be. Maybe maybe if, if the divine nature is best, then it shouldn't be involved in patricide. You know, that's kind of soccer mm -hmm. take on things. Um, but he he in his typical fashion, he always assumes that other people know better than he does about things, or at least he postures himself as that. And so he says, "Okay, so you get this figured out. Teach me what it is." And Euthyphro's first statement is, "What is dear to the gods is pious, and what is not dear is impious." And Socrates' response is really, really important one if we're going to make the transposition of the Euthyphro dilemma into our context correctly, because it does need to be transposed um, for just this reason. Socrates says, but the gods disagree among themselves. Right. Right. And so then how can you say what's dear, which god are we talking about? Is it what's dear to Zeus or is it what's dear to Hera or whatever else? And this came up when we talked about the Iliad mm, a few months right. ago, right? Because yeah you see that discord on display and it comes into it has real bearing on particular situations in the book yeah that's right and you see it in, you know in the orestes uh, athena and apollo have to step in in order to mediate between these two warring commands of the gods and, and, and to calm the furies down and turn them into the humanities um so it's, that's that's a particularly polytheistic version of this Right, because discord within the divine nature about what is to be done is not something that transposes into a Christian understanding of divine of the divine and theological ethics. Uh that's true for the most part, though I have heard versions of it, I think, where um God wants one thing, but he settles for something else because of the nature of finite creatures. I don't know. It, it's not I don't find it persuasive, yeah. but I've heard but then but then it that is what sets off alarm bells in my head because it's right. like well that's not really different from the pagan. Right. Doctrine. That's right because the, the the orthodox Christian doctrine is this unity of will among the three persons and that's usually interpreted to mean that they have one will, like numerically yeah. one will, not that they all agree in their three wills about the one thing, right? right. Um, so, so that that part is not so troublesome for us. But then this this does it is a big problem for Euthyphro, and so then he winds up backing off and saying, "Well, okay, what I mean is, if the gods agree that something is to be loved, then that's." clearly what we're talking about and if they agree that something is to be hated that's clearly out of bounds given that the gods disagree so much and so famously when they can agree about something that's a we can be very confident that this is actually the important stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um Socrates then wants to ask the question that's this kind of the most famous question for the dialogue which is um is the just or the pious and they, they kind of go back and forth on on that throughout the dialogue equating just and pious is the just or the pious loved uh is it is it just because it is loved by the gods or is it loved by the gods because it is just right that is to say is it true that anything all of the gods could agree to love would become just would be right or is there a standard of justice outside of the gods that the gods look to that determines how they, uh, and that's the reason why they do it. This is the central conversation we need to have because this is the central euthyphos of the dilemma. And so it might be worth taking some time to lay out a little bit of what's at stake in either of the positions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first position being that a thing is pious because it's loved by the gods. Yeah. Yeah. So in which case the gods could through consensus come to love anything. Murder. Murder could be loved. Well, yeah. and if you think about the way, the reason that for Euthyphro, his case resonates with the gods because they have the experience with Cronus and, and overthrowing him because he was a murderer, child murderer. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say they had a good dad. Yeah. Then they might not be so keen on the prosecuting your father thing, in yeah. which case it's an impious action. Right. So, yeah, so we can justify, we could potentially justify anything if we settle on the first horn of the, of the, uh, of the dilemma, because goodness is, or piety is totally arbitrary. Or rather, the gods could potentially justify yes. anything. Correct. Um and then and then we would need to have a discussion about what are the conditions for the divine will being locked into one or another um configuration relative to a given action right right and we will come back around to that on the other hand if the pious is pious uh, if the gods love the pious because it's pious then what that means is 
there is something you're looking somewhere other than the nature of the Olympian gods for what is actually pious. Um, this resonates very, very well with the rest of Plato's philosophy. In the Timaeus, the demiurge looks upon the form of the good and creates on the basis of that, imitating the form of the goods. And one of the one of the things he creates are the gods. Mm -hmm. And then the gods themselves look upward to the form of the good and they do their best imitation. And then that's how we get um, humans in the physical world and whatnot. Which is which is often not a very good imitation. That's right. That's right. And that's exactly the point is the Demiurge couldn't create uh, the physical world because everyone's got to do the best they can do. And the best he can do is the Greek gods. And so the gods have got to be delegated that task because their best is not going to be that good. And that will give us the physical world that the Demiurge sees patterned out in the form of the good. Um, so it's quite clear that not only is there a demiurge above the gods, unclear what his relationship is, but even the demiurge, the creator of Timaeus, is not the one true god. He is the, the a craftsman who looks at something above himself also. And so the form of the good is the highest thing we ever see with any clarity in Plato. Um, and it, that's not it's not clear whether there's some god connected to that or not. And Socrates has these very obscure statements that make you think oh my gosh like say more about that right the one the one true god who's you know what, what is that um so so then the concern might be that the divine nature might not be the highest thing right, if right. the divine nature has to look outside of itself for the pattern of behavior right it makes god look a lot more like us having to follow a set of rules or do his best to be a good moral agent um, and, and you might, you can then imagine the situation, well, well, it's a good thing that he's so good at being good because it's a real possibility that he could fail at that. You introduce a space between the divine nature and goodness. So those are the two concerns. On the one hand, arbitrariness. Um, how do we know that the good is, you know, that we feel naturally like the good shouldn't be just, well, you know, because I said so, like like the answer we often give our children, why should why can't I play in the street? Right. There should be something more behind because I said so that you just don't have time to explain or don't have they don't have the capacity to understand. But if it really does come down to you could very well do that thing you want to do. I just don't want you to do it. And so I I just say no, that's very that's very unsatisfying if you're the child. And on the other hand, we don't want it to be such as to say, well, um, I mean, this is this is the way it is in such a way that even God is bound by this form of action because then that God seems less absolute and it seems as if maybe that's not the highest nature then. Right. So that's the dilemma. That's the dilemma. And and so perhaps we could. I think, well, I think the way that it's framed there transposes well into a into a more Christian context. That's right. Um. I don't know that we have to do a whole lot there other than to just say, does God give commands because they're those things he commands are good or because um, he's he's sort of striving to act in a good way. And so, you know, this could be a potentially damaging argument for a Christian, especially maybe mm -hmm. one who's unfamiliar with the dilemma, mm -hmm. someone who hasn't thought about it too much. So why don't you start? I know I think this we might slightly disagree on this a little bit. And so I think it would be interesting. So how would you explain your way out of the Euthyphro dilemma to someone who would ask you about it? Yeah, so I would I would turn my attention to this question of arbitrariness, and I would point out that um, there are two ways for something to be arbitrary, and, and only one of them is vicious. Um, because arbitrary originally really just means, and originally just means related to a will, an arbitrium. Um, and this is in most places in Christian theology, actually a positive making feature. It is only spiritual beings, rational creatures that have, or rational beings that have the capacity of will. Will is one of the two functions of the rational nature and the highest act of the will is to love. And so insofar as you get an, a vision in someone like Dante of God's love being the foundation and the ground of all things, it's really going back to the divine will, right? And there are these unsearchable uh, plans of God that such that we can't give an antecedent account for them. In fact, I would argue that one of the features of a free will is that it is not determined by the conditions that precede it. If you know, if you if you set before me a plate of bacon and uh, I must eat it, 
because my love for bacon is such that I am incapable of controlling myself, then we would say in normal ways of talking about things, I'm not free in that moment um, if I'm, I'm compelled to eat the bacon. Um, but if it's the case that even though I really, really love bacon, and even though I'm starving, I haven't eaten for days, and I'm so, but if I, but if I'm fasting for the sake of something greater, and so I might choose to say no. So now, when you set the plate of bacon in front of me, you don't know what I'm going to choose. Um, everything there's a there's a lot of reason to bet on me going for the bacon. There's also a reason to bet against me going for the bacon. But no matter how uh, overwhelming the odds are that I will grab a piece of bacon, there always remains a little bit of space left where you don't know what I'm going to do, where no one knows what I'm going to do because it's not actual what I'm going to do until I decide, where I get a chance to make the world different than it was before. That's a space of freedom. Okay, so what's all that got to do with the Euthyphro dilemma? Well, um, if it's true that... Um, you know, God decides to create. Why? I don't know. I've been a theologian for decades, and I've spent a lot of time in a lot of different places of theology, and I cannot tell you why God decided to create rather than not to create. I can't tell you why God decided to do any of the things that he does. Why did God decide to give us free will, which seems to be the worst decision that God has ever made because of all the horrible things that followed from it? I infer that God must value free will enough to make it worth it, to consider it worth it on his part. But I can't give an account for that. And the, you could say that's just because God's thoughts are so much higher than my thoughts that I can never know them. And in, and in some sense, that's certainly true. But I think it's also just a feature of freedom that you can't give an account for why the thing went to the left rather than to the right. So if that's the case, is a type of arbitrariness that is really just a way of referencing the free choices of a creature with will that is not the same as the type of arbitrariness that says God flips a coin. Should murder be good or bad? I don't know. Let's flip a coin here and see what we got. Let's create a coin and then flip it. Okay, uh, tails. Tails, murder is bad. Okay, that's what we're going to do, guys. We're doing murder is bad. Then there's no reason behind it. Okay, but what's the reason for an arbitrary decision in the first sense? The reason for an arbitrary decision in the first sense is not a reason in the sense of a rational account that determines what the decision had to be. It's rather a desire in the part of the person who made the choice that the will be configured in such a way. Remember that the highest action of the will is love. And so when we talk about willing something, when we talk about something being arbitrary in that sense, we're talking about what is desired. So I find it, here's the, here's the big punchline on this, and I, I thank you for your patience, listeners, as I ramble on about this, but my big punchline is I find it more pious to worship God for who he is rather than for what he is or even what he has done. <laughs> no, I think I have to start with, actually, I started with fearing him <laughs> for what he might do and then progress to worshiping him for what he has done, and I'm trying to move beyond that. Um, but in my mind, if my worship for God is based upon the fact that God is good because God does, God must be good, because the divine nature is such as to be good, and so that's the what of God, I find that to be less praiseworthy than worshiping the who of God, the divine persons. It's like saying, I'm, I'm the king's man, and if the king should swerve, I'm going to stay loyal to the king. That would be deplorable in the case of a human king um, because the human king is not inherently worthy of praise. But if the father is inherently worthy of praise, maybe even that is above whether he is adhering to one or another system of ethics about what's good or bad. Okay. Yeah, or counterpoint, ladies and gentlemen, Father Wesley. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I do approach it differently, the question differently. Um, and I fall I and I do fall back uh, on the nature of God um, to answer the Euthyphro dilemma, which is that um, it is from God's nature that our concepts of truth, goodness, beauty and, and all the other sort of transcendental uh, things come from. Mm -hmm. um, and so we understand God not as a being who strives to be good, 
or as an arbitrary chooser of goodness and badness, but goodness itself. Mm -hmm. Just like God doesn't exist in the same way that you and I exist. We exist mm -hmm. as contingent beings, um, and he is essential. I mean, he is being itself, you know. So mm -hmm. there's this kind of creature-creator distinction there that that muddies the waters a little bit for us from our perspective because it's so hard to comprehend. Um, that is our creator, you know, what is our creator? Right. right. So when I say, God, so I would say God isn't good. He is goodness. And... For me, this is not a constraint on God, as if we say, God, you have to act good, but rather this is actually the ultimate freedom, because if it's true that God is being, and if it's true that he is goodness, then badness isn't a separate thing he could choose, but it would be the lack of existence. So it would be nonsensical at that point. For me to think, oh, God could just pick this or that. Um, and so I, where I get a little concerned in terms mm -hmm. of, the, of the arguments that attempt to preserve God's freedom. So the, and, and, and the question of why would God create? We agree that's a good action, mm -hmm. right? Um, so why would God choose to do that? On the one hand, I would affirm wholeheartedly, completely, 100%, that God didn't have to create. There was nothing compelling God to make the world. He mm -hmm. didn't need it. Um, nothing outside of him could have possibly provoked him to do it. He chose to. Why? I don't know. Like you, it keeps me up at night. But <laughs> it, it, he did. He chose to. So while I... And, and the other facet of this is that we would assert that God is pure action that there's not potential in God because potential mm. belongs to a finite creature, right? So mm. I have the potential, you know, well, I, I used to have the potential maybe way back in the day to become a, an athlete mm. you know, if I trained harder and ate better and all these things. But that potential has gone away now because I have actualized other paths that involve drinking a lot of beer and eating a lot of food um, oh, yeah. and not working out as much as I should have. <laughs> so, so thank you. <laughs> so the point is that God doesn't, uh, he, because he's creator, not creature, he doesn't have potentials in him. So in my affirmation that God didn't have to create, I'm also very wary of accounts of his good action that would say he could have, the, the same God who's revealed himself through the act of creation could have just not created. Because then I think we're positing a kind of what I would describe as a sort of idolatrous picture of God standing before a decision tree. Well, I could do this or I could do that. So I'm going to choose this course. And I think that becomes really problematic. So I want to preserve God's freedom and say, of course, he didn't have to create, but he chose to create. And so to then make a hypothetical of, well, what if he had done this this way? becomes uh, a little sketchy. We could posit that about Zeus. What if Zeus had done this during the Trojan War instead of that, and the whole thing would have turned out differently? But that's because exactly what we're talking about. The, the Greek gods don't pass the Euthyphro dilemma. Mm -hmm. And so we can't posit those things about God. So, so God gives us commands to do certain things and those things are good because they are participating in his nature. Mm -hmm. Now, of course I agree with you. We should love God for who he is or, or simply because he is not because of what he's done or because of, um, or because we're scared of him. Imperfect contrition is a good thing if it gets you to the confessional, but it's mm -hmm. got to, uh, it's got to be the, the fullness of the Christian life or, or of, of, I think, even if you're not specifically Christian, but the fullness of what we're talking about is when you you do it for its own sake. Mm -hmm. So I certainly am, t am, am attuned to that, but I do think that locating goodness in God's nature is a, is a way, at least the way that I tend to approach the question of, of raised by the Euthyphro dilemma. Good, okay. I, I, I would push back against the possibility stuff, but for different reasons that are gonna lead us into a different metaphysics that are not it's grounded in Plato. So let's let's set that aside. Okay. Let's just focus on the divine nature. And let's ask this question. Um, 
So God, God's nature is the way that it is. And God's nature is, among other things, omnibenevolent. This is not something we have to speculate about or wonder about. This has been revealed to us. And those of us who know him have experienced this, that God's nature is all good. Is God good because God wills to be good? Or does God have to be good? Or is there a third option? Hmm. Is God good because he wills to be good or because he has to be good? Or is there a third option? I mean, I think based on what I'm trying to articulate, I would have to say there has to be a third option. It God isn't willing to be good in a way that, that there's a sort of dichotomy between or, or a dichotomous choice between goodness and badness. And God is choosing to go with the good side. Mm-hmm. Um, he doesn't have to be good insofar as, as the goodness exists outside of him. So I, so I guess I would say there's a third option and the third option would have to be perhaps grounded simply in the, in the fact of, of God being existence itself. Let's let, let's ask this from a little Socratic discussion about this then. So let's let's move from you've moved us from goodness to existence, so we'll stick to existence. Does God exist unwillingly? Is God unwilling to exist? Hmm. Come, you before answer me. Surely you know. <laughs> <laughs> I am the younger and more brash one, I suppose. Um <laughs> Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I, he certainly doesn't. Well, and, and existence is certainly not exi- existence is certainly not a sort of prison for God. Yeah, it couldn't be conceived that way. Yeah, because then it would be something. Existence would be something outside of him that would be imposed on him. Right. Right. So he. So yes, and in terms of God, well, and and I think this would this would also go back to uh, sort of the basic Christian doctrine that we would assert that God is um, sufficient in and of Himself. Uh huh. Uh huh. So you would say then God does not exist, and therefore God is not good against God's will. No. Okay. Is does God exist or is God good apart from God's will? That is to say, there's this old phrase that you get in, in Shakespeare that becomes a silly thing. It is willy nil he, right? Will, whether he wills it or whether he nails it, wills against it, he would exist and he would be good. So he's, he's not good against his will. Is he good apart from any question of whether he wills it or not? Hmm. I'm not quite sure I understand the distinction in terms of his, in terms of you're talking about his self willing. Yeah. Is he good according to his? Um, I uh, hmm. I think it would raise some interesting questions to me about the relationship between what we call God's will and and who He is. Mm. Because I know in my own self there can be a disjunction between those things, and they're sort of separate parts of who I am. Mm-hmm. But I'm not sure. I want to be careful, A, that I understand exactly what you're getting at, and B, that I'm not projecting my own sort of psychological processes onto God mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in positing a sort of potential disruption between the things. Right. Because okay. I know where those break down in me. Yeah. But that's because I'm a fallible, finite creature. Yeah. I think Anselm tries to answer just to motivate a middle space between. So if there are three states of the will, classically, you can will before something, you can be against something, or you can just not have a state of will towards anything, which we don't really have a good word for. Um, and um, Anselm tries to motivate something in the middle that's not quite that no, that apathetic position by saying that essentially um, God is not good because God wills to be good. God is necessarily good, which means that God has no choice about the matter, if you'd like to use that language. But God is not sullenly good. (laughs) 
Yeah. Right. And so God, uh, God freely chooses to be the way that God has to be. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of and some things collapses the question to where um, and this is readers, this is a safe off ramp for the Euthyphro dilemma. If, if you if you're really feeling this as an existential concern and you're looking for a safe way out of this, then a good neutral path out is God freely chooses to be the way God has to be. And so there's no disjunct possible and it's just consistent all the way across the board and you're good to go. So that's a place where I'm, I'm willing to let someone retreat to mm -hmm. and be done with it. But for those of you who don't want to take that off ramp, who don't want to retreat just yet into that space, I would push a little further. And I would say, um, if there's some part of us that feels that God should not just be acquiescing in the way his being is, but should actually in some sense be positively choosing the way his being is, um, then we arrive at an interpretation of we're back at this notion you said before. God is a uh, God is from Himself. God is sufficient, but everything about God is explained in terms of something about God, right? Mm -hmm. God, all the truths about God come from God's nature and from from something about God and not from elsewhere. And there's only really two places in God we can talk about because of simplicity. You can talk about the nature or the persons. And those are going to reduce to each other, but not in exactly the same way. Otherwise, there wouldn't be three persons. So you can, one place, I think the the um, the answer to the Euthyphro dilemma that says that God loves the good because it is good, locates the place in God where God's goodness comes from in that part of God, speaking metaphorically and very loosely, um, that is not the divine will rather in the something other than the divine will elsewhere in, in God than that. Um, and so then the will has a choice that's not really a choice to assent to what must be or to be sullen about what must be, right? Um, and no one thinks that God is sullen about being good, at least no one I know. Um, I want to consider um, what is impious about the place where God's goodness comes from being the divine will rather than somewhere else in the divine. In other words, the God should say, I choose to be this way. I choose, my, choose my nature to be this way. And as a result of God choosing that his nature be this way, it means that the good will be what it is because the good, the true and the beautiful, as you said before, flow out of the way God is. Um, the, the reality has to be keyed to the truths of God. And I would even say that God is necessarily good, but I would root the, that necessity. Obviously, we're not rooting it anywhere outside of God. There is nowhere outside of God to root it. And everything not God is created by God, so there just isn't any other option. So we're not going to root that necessity outside of God, but I would root it in the divine will, that God chooses to be a loving God, that God chooses to be a God who respects life and loves freedom and um, and all these sorts of things, and that all of the richness of the good, true, and beautiful that we experience in the created world is the result of the first choice of God not to create the world to be such as it is, but to be the type of God that God is. This is interesting. I um choosing from one's nature is an interesting phrase. Mm -hmm. Um, because you th if you think about your nature, I mean, I suppose there are things about our natures we can attempt to control. You know, you might feel a certain pull to something and 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 make a choice to, I guess, to act with or without that impulse. On the other hand, it's I don't know. It's an interesting thought because then i'm not sure in terms of god what it necessarily how that necessarily explains away the problem because if he's choosing from his nature then we're already saying that the nature i i guess i guess i would just say from my perspective that sounds fine because I, what i'm saying is that god's nature is the sort of foundation of his goodness so if he chooses mm -hmm. from his nature then yeah sure he's acting in accordance with himself yeah, let, let me let me motivate the image this way. And this is, I think, that's helpful the way you just said it, because you mentioned before that we don't want to project up onto God the right. creature conditions, infallible conditions and whatnot. So there's a lot of stuff about my nature that I would have changed when I was younger. Um, 
and I think I, I I would I guess the reason I don't want to change that now is not necessarily because I've acquired wisdom as so much as I've just become resigned. Um, <laughs> but um, but I would have I would have designed myself quite differently in a, in a, in a wide variety of ways um, from from physical appearance to my name to um, you know fantastical and amazing abilities. Um, that wasn't on the table. I didn't get to choose what powers the human nature would have. I didn't get to choose of all the things human natures can do, what my human nature would be able to do. There's lots of things that I still try to do with my human nature that I haven't learned yet. I can't do. I didn't get to choose what family I'd be born in and on and on and on. There's all these things. And that's part of being a creature. Yeah, right. right. And so, yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're pair allied. We're, we're made through another. And so we get these things set for us at the beginning, but a being who is, I say, his nature comes not from nowhere, but from himself. Mm -hmm. It's self-generating, right? And so the the nature, I think, describes, to me, nature is describes the way that God is. But before the way that God is, is the, the type of God that God wished to be. And so for me, I see rather than will arising as a power of nature, as it does among humans and angels and demons, I see nature arising from the activity of the will in God. And that that inverse is one of the differences between being from yourself and from another. So then I guess the question that I would have is if, and I assume we're talking in a sort of logical priority rather than, yes. but Temple. but but yeah. if that means that there could be a different nature then mm -hmm. yes there could be and so then the question could have been there could not be but there could, right. have been. could have been could have been and and then the question that usually comes next is well then how can we trust that god is going to be good mm -hmm. if god could not be good and i'm going to say my trust that god's goodness to me will not fail is not based on the fact that he doesn't have any choice about it it's based on the fact that he said he wouldn't i trust him when he says that he wouldn't, right? So there is, um, it's much the same as saying, and this is something that, you know, folks in the Augustinian tradition and the Thomas tradition are quite comfortable with. God has absolute power and order power. Um, could God have saved humanity otherwise than through the incarnation and death of Christ? And they would say, according to God's absolute power, absolutely. Right? That is to say, without recourse to any of the other things that God has chosen and done, God has the freedom to do that. According to God's ordered power, this is the fitting way for it to be done. And they want to say God's not actually free to act in a non-fitting way. And so, but he's only back in that corner of having to do it that way because of prior choices that he made. And so, and that's reasonably considered to be one of the things that he chose in setting up things beforehand the way that he did. I want to say something a little bit similar, which is to say that um, according to absolute power, the divine nature could have been different. But we live in the world where God has bound himself forever to be this way. And because God is trustworthy, we don't have to worry that he's going to change his mind about that. I think this is where, for me, this becomes a little bit hard. To yeah. accept specifically because I think we go back to the actuality versus potentiality question. Um, if it would have been possible for God to have chosen a different nature, then I, I guess I struggle to see how that's not in some ways an unrealized potential. And yeah, I don't know. And I think that the um, the, the, I, we were talking about this beforehand, but I was just engaging in a in a conversation with a neo Thomist about this in the past couple of weeks, who had written an article about um, about some of these very questions that we're talking about. And I found, I, in my opinion, he failed the arbitrary horn of the Euthyphro dilemma. Um, but I, I, yeah. So I guess for me, again, to go back to to my earlier point about about the sort of nature of god and the, and and being the fount of of these things goodness he is goodness um that that then explains the fittingness arguments mm -hmm. you know you read anselm and and all these people and they, and their whole arguments are based on what's fitting yeah god does this because it's fitting and you know that is actually an argument that some of the sort of neotomists will make you know that fittingness does sort of um 
as a standard does kind of box God into the the opposite horn of the Euthyphro dilemma that he has to act towards what's fitting. Uh -huh. But I again I think if you see these superl not superlatives, but if you see these, you know, if you see him as goodness itself, then it's not a limit, but it, but the opposite. So him acting the most in the most fitting way, it might be hard for us to understand, but I don't see that as an external constraint. So I guess that's that's where I would push back. Is it just it feels to me like we're like we're positing some sort of potentiality in God, which sounds like it frees him, but it doesn't. Right. And this is uh, I will say this briefly on the potential thing. I I think there's a sickness in Western philosophy around the question of potentiality of okay. possible being. I think that, so if you think about being on the one end and non-being on the other end, okay? So there's your sort of, I call it a spectrum, call it two points. That's a different question that's that's worthy of discussion. But you've got being and you've got its opposite, non-being. Okay, non-being doesn't exist. And this is already a place where we've not done very well all the time in the Western tradition because you'll get people like even Athanasius who feels that mankind was is naturally mortal uh because we were made from nothing and nothing exerts this pull like a black hole on our being when to suck us back in and so at creation we had this additional grace that made us immortal but when we sinned god took that grace away and it, we reverted to our natural mortal state non-being doesn't exist it has no gravity it doesn't exert any kind of force it's not we need to stop reifying nothing Right. Okay. So that's, I think we can go so far there without too much problem, at least between you and I. Now, the question is, where does possible being go on this scale? And I think the sickness of Western philosophy is that we treat possible being as almost being and put it way over on the being side of the scale as just one step away from being actualized being. That creates all kinds of problems like the ones you're describing around possible being, because then you have to account for it as if it were a positive thing. Possible being is non-being. Possible being is non-existence. And so something God could have done is not something put, something true about God that's a potentiality that has to be dealt with. It's just a branching pathway. God could have created a unicorn and God did not, I, pres I presume. I don't know for sure, but I don't think God created a unicorn unless you mean a rhinoceros. But um, so I think if, if we get possibility right as being just a species of non-existence, then the concern that you're raising, the Thomas concern about God needing to be pure actuality, otherwise he becomes imperfect and subject to change, doesn't materialize. Now, I'm going to say that I think that is too big a uh, statement to get you to assent to in the space of time that I presented it to you. So please feel no pressure to agree with that. Yeah, yeah, I still think but it, it's not that it's not that I'm concerned about where the possible being goes, but rather what it says about the kind of being that God is to have potentiality that he to have a branch that he says I'm not doing that. That is a bigger concern for me. It's not. I. I the, you're right. I don't. It. The, that. What could have been that wasn't doesn't affect what is. Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> it's, it's um, a good way to say that. But. But. Uh, so, so then, anything other than what God has done is logically impossible in the strongest possible sense. I'm not sure I'd go that far, but I would. I would. I think I would say from a creaturely perspective that the speculation about the what could have been can become a form of idolatry. I feel like that's an epistemological slash pastoral sure. point rather than a theological metaphysical point. That's probably fair and would explain a lot because that is the lens through which I come <laughs> very often on things. <laughs> have we confused them enough yet? <laughs> that's right. That's right. But I, but also, I mean, I, yeah. In terms of how we do theology, so I suppose it's an it's it's an epistemology claim more than anything. Um, in other words, my my problem would be I'm not sure what you get from saying it, and I only see problems when it comes up as a as an actual, you know. So, for example, I mean, uh, yeah, I can I can envision a world in which. <laughs> 
uh, Mike McCarthy was a better football coach than he is now, and the Cowboys actually won the Super Bowl. <laughs> and I can imagine what that world would look like. But again, these are finite events and finite creatures acting in a finite space. And so, of course, we can always see the trade-offs and everything. From a creaturely vantage point, to then make the claim about God that he could have done this or he could have done that or he didn't have to do this or he didn't have to do that, then leads to a kind of nonsense that I, yeah, I, I suppose it is an uh, epistemological issue. But I do think it has to be sort of wrestled with a little bit that it requires it requires a vantage point that we simply don't have. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so we could never be justified in claiming that something other than what God has done would be better or that it has been done or anything like that. Like we we, we can't go to a positive assertion. But I I fear my concern is that if we don't have space for God to have before him the infinite range of possibilia of which he actualizes whichever ones he wants to for reasons that are beyond our kin, um, then we run the risk of absolutizing our actual world history in such a way that um, it becomes necessary and non-contingent and it becomes normative in ways that would be deeply problematic. Sure. I am sensitive to that critique. Sounds fair. I don't I don't have a great response to it. I think it's it's probably the best argument against the position that I've laid out. So I feel like what we've done here is perf this is what we hoped to do, I think, um, is performed a really good um, drama of what's at stake in the euthyphro dilemma and why it continues to be one of the first things you put students onto when they get into philosophy. That's right. right. Absolutely. Well, now that we've figured out all the theological problems. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> That's right. Well, perhaps Wait, we could... decide. <laughs> right. That, uh, yeah. um, maybe we could move into our in notes section, because I do think we've kept our, our poor listeners hostage long enough. We're, <laughs> we're bordering on a Geneva Convention violation, cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> Okay, I had a super hard time with an endnote for this one and actually didn't come to me until while you were speaking as we were recording um, because I know that as I've lived my life, I have uh, encountered on dozens of occasions instances where I'm like, that's just the Euthyphro dilemma all over again. And I couldn't think of any of them over the course of the last month that I've been thinking about this. Um, so listeners, I'm going to leave you with something not new to you probably. If it is, shame on you. Um, but just to remind you to revisit something that um, really helps you to inhabit the space of dilemma. And that is U2's song, With or Without You. That's amazing. <laughs> Big U2 fan, huh? Oh, yes. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna have to re-listen to it in light of the... I've never, I've never listened to it in light of the Euthyphro dilemma before. That'll be fantastic. Love it. Um, for me, I'm going to, I'm going to do two, uh, things, um, and they sort of complement each other, I think, um, in, at least in some ways. And, and these are two th places that have sort of formed the way that I would approach the youth for a dilemma. The first is Anselm, which you mentioned, mm -hmm. Cordeus Homo, he specifically talks about it, but I think Proslogion, um, the idea of God as, as that which nothing greater can be conceived, uh, again, kind of. I think is explains where some of my discomfort with the with the potentiality comes into play mm -hmm. is wanting to preserve that uh, description of of who God is, um, and then and then a more contemporary source that I think is really helpful. And again, I don't think he really addresses the Euthyphro dilemma directly, but I think if you if you were to read it, you would be able to take some principles away that would have bearing on the discussion, which is Herbert McCabe's book, God Matters. Mm. I love Herbert McCabe. He was a, a very crotchety kind of mid to late 20th century uh, Thomist. He was a he was a, a Dominican friar and uh, an editor of New Black Friars and, and a real cantankerous man. He was uh he was once suspended from being the editor of Blackfriars because he wrote a scathing article critical of a man who had uh who had walked away from the church, mm -hmm. and the man said that it was it was for corruption, and so McCabe said, of course the church is corrupt. That's never a reason to leave it. Mm 
and got suspended for a few years. And then when he got reinstated as the editor, uh, began his first article back with, as I was saying before, I was so oddly interrupted. Uh, um, <laughs> so just a really uh, fascinating man and, uh, and it, uh, has had a great deal of influence on, on the contemporary thinker Terry Eagleton. Mm. Um, who regularly uh, regurgitates the line of McCabe's that um, to to be human is to love, and, and if you love, you'll be killed. <laughs> um, and so anyway, so I, I, I really like Herbert McCabe. The first three or four chapters in God Matters, he talks about creation, freedom, and sin, mm. and, and takes a pretty classically theistic approach to those questions, but in a really uh, succinct and kind of biting way. And so I, I, I can't commend those two uh, more than, than, than that. Yeah. So Wonderful. excellent. Well, listeners, thank you so much for supporting us and for, for going along on this journey with us and reading these books with us. We hope that you will engage us in conversation more. You can do that uh, on the episode in the comments on our Substack, uh, or you can, uh, you can join our Substack community for $5 a month. And uh, we have a chat that goes on. And, and so you'd be welcome to uh, contribute to the conversation there. So thank you so much for listening. And in the meantime, keep reading.